Welcome to Level the Paying Field. My name is Katie Ward, and I'm Commissioner and CAO of Ontario's Pay Equity Commission. Over the past few months, I spoke with economists, policymakers, activists, and global thought leaders in the equity space, and we wanted to share those conversations with you. So we launched the series, Level the Paying Field, to share what we learned about economics, equity, women, work, and money. Part of our inspiration for having these conversations was how, in the midst of a global pandemic, which disproportionately impacted women around the world, global multilateral organizations came together to inaugurate the first ever International Equal Pay Day on September 18th, 2020. This was an initiative led by United Nation members, including Australia, Canada, Germany, Iceland, New Zealand, Panama, South Africa, and Switzerland, with a total of 105 UN member states co-sponsoring the resolution to establish September 18th as International Equal Pay Day. We wanted to know more about pay equity's resurgence as an imperative to economic recovery. We don't need to read all the reports to know that women at work and women at home have been disadvantaged through the start of the pandemic. At the same time, we have seen so many stories about women at work and so many reports looking at the economics of equity. Over the past year, we have coined the terms she session, she covery, with governments and agencies talking about a feminist post-COVID recovery. This series of conversations we're sharing is intended to keep the conversation going so policymakers at both the federal and provincial levels continue enforcing and creating legislation or programs that address women's economic justice and support closing the gender wage gap. To begin the series, I spoke with my colleagues at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD and the International Labor Organization, or ILO. Both organizations were instrumental in inaugurating International Equal Pay Day. And together, in collaboration with UN Women, OECD and ILO make up the Interna Equal Pay International Coalition, or EPIC. EPIC advocates and organizes for equal pay globally. So in the first part of the conversation I'm sharing with you today, I spoke with Monica Questler. Ms. Questler is head of the Social Policy Division and Senior Counselor to the Director of the Employment, Labor, and Social Affairs Directorate at the OECD. She and I discuss OECD's motivation for supporting International Equal Pay Day, what the OECD is doing to support equal pay, and how their gender data portal is transforming what we know and how we think about the gender wage gap. OECD, as you know, leads the Equal Pay International Coalition together with United Nations Women and the International Labor Organization. And we know that OECD members have seen progress in closing the gender wage gap, though the gap does persist across OADC members. So I wanted to ask you, why does that gap persist from what you've learned through research and what needs to be done to continue to close the gap? So, so the, the Equal Pay International Coalition is indeed a very interesting initiative that um, the OECD, the ILO, and UN Women together founded. And we're so delighted to have many countries now on board. Canada is a big player in, the, uh, in, in, in EPIC, as we call it. And, and there's companies there, there's trade unions there, countries, like I said, international organizations. So we're really happy that this is taking off and that we're tr building a truly a, a coalition that is fighting this gender pay gap. Uh, I think we have to work on different areas. First of all, we have to understand it better. And unfortunately, despite data, despite the best analysis, when you do the, 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 the calculations and you decompose, you look at here's the gap, the full gap, and then you chop it up into little pieces, what we call decompose, and say this part comes from the fact that girls are going into different occupations. This part comes from the fact that they have children. Um, then there's different sectors in which uh, women work. So it's not only the education, but even we looked at even women who were um, going into STEM and who were trained to be scientists, oftentimes they ended up in schools teaching science, mm -hmm. being in a lab or being in, a, in, a, in an innovative company doing science there. So, so it's not only what you study, but then where you go. Do you go to the private sector? Do you go to the public sector? Do you work full hours or do you spend a lot of time working shorter hours because you're trying to combine it with school time of children? Um, so these are all factors. But then there's a huge part of this gender wage gap, which is called unexplained. That means you don't really know where it comes from. And what is that? Those are the more nasty things like discrimination. These are things we all know exist, um, but you can't really measure them. 
So there's other factors that come into play, um, which we really um, have to know more about and we have to get a better handle on and we have to continue to push hard and explore further how to do this. Can you tell us how the OECD's gender data portal helps policymakers and leaders better understand the gender gaps? Sure. Um, the OECD gender data portal is a, a collection. It's like a platform where we collect lots of different things. As the name says, data is, of course, a really important part of it. And data is what drives policy. So that's why we at the OECD really um, place so much emphasis on data. If we don't know what's really going on, it's going to be very hard to convince anybody, anybody to change anything. So um, it's not enough to say, oh, but women are disadvantaged in the labor market and they don't get nice jobs and so on. No, we really have to document it. We have to say, how much is the gender wage gap? In what sectors is it happening? At what ages is it happening? When does it kick in? Um, where does it come from? Hence, education. You mentioned that we have at the OECD education, employment, and entrepreneurship. And those are what we call the three E's. This is where 10 years ago we started in our gender initiative because education is really where inequality foundations are laid. So we, we have all these data and we put them there and on the data portal um, can enables everybody, whether they're researchers, students, policymakers, anybody who visits this data portal to select indicators and to choose their comparator countries. So it's a very easy thing to use. And I was told actually that journalists love it because if you want to go and you know write an article and find how does Canada compare, how does another country compare, and then you say, I don't really want to be compared to Japan, I'd rather be compared to the Americas. So you click on the countries you want to look at and you get it all. So, so it's a very easy and accessible way to get a very clear picture and a quantitative picture on what is going on. And not only that, we beyond data, you also will find links to videos, to um, ongoing work, to events, uh, to um, blogs, and, and many other things. And in the last 10 years, the OECD has expanded beyond those three E's of the education, uh, employment, and entrepreneurship into many other areas. So you will find many other um, topics, digitalization and women, um, women in agriculture, women in trade, women in environment. So, so we have many other topics now that are also covered um, by our work. The International Labor Organization, or ILO, is another multilateral organization using research and data to understand how the gender wage gap is closing so we can better understand what is yet to be done. Next, I spoke with Emanuela Pozen, a senior specialist on gender equality with the ILO. In our conversation, we examined what data tells us about global trends in wage equity, women's employment, and how the care economy impacts both of these. Um, so September 18th, 2020, marked the inaugural International Equal Pay Day. And this day of recognition was launched in the middle of a global pandemic that we know disproportionately affected women in the workplace. What was the impetus that made recognizing this day so compelling at this time? International Equal Pay Day last year, and this year as well, is a reminder of the inequalities that persist in the world of work, but it's also a call to action. It's mm -hmm. a moment to celebrate and to call uh, all, all actors in the labor market or anyone that can do something to address, um, to address the issues of uh, gender equality in the world of work and to address the issue of equal pay for work of we equal value. So we, uh, the EPIC, Equal Pay International Coalition, uh, we're very proud uh, to, to be part of celebrating International Equal Pay Day. And we look forward to the next one, which will be on the 18th of September. Um, in 2019, your team did some really exceptional research on women at work called the Quantum Leap for Gender Equality, which highlighted some persistent barriers for women. What barriers were identified related to the gender wage gap? Uh, thanks for this question. And um, you see, when we look at the gender pay gap, uh, we are confronted with a very uncomfortable data uh, mm. because the gender wage gap remains 18.8% uh, throughout the world, ranging from 12.6% in low-income countries to 20.9% 
in upper middle income countries. So it is an issue that um, is, is widespread. It's, it's, it's in pretty much everywhere, every country. And, and uh, it's something that calls for uh, clearly some, some clear answers. Um, but you're asking me about the reasons and the barriers. And um, the gender wage gap is, um, is the result of compounded inequalities that accumulate over women's time, uh, over, over, over mm -hmm. life's time. And, and these inequalities that accumulate are also exacerbated by multiple grounds of discrimination, such as ethnicity, color, race, migration status, age, and, and more. And so here we need a compass, you know, to navigate all of this, because these are just some of the reasons. As I said, it's a very complex, uh, uh, the, the gender wage gap is the result of many, many different factors. And so the compass is, the international treaty, the international convention of the International Labor Organization, convention number 100, which is on equal remuneration. This is very important because it is essential to address the conscious and unconscious biases in the determination of the value of the work that is performed by women relatively to the work performed by men. And here I would just like to underline that when we talk about the right to receive equal pay, this is not confined to uh, uh, equal or similar work. So we're not talking just of the two people doing the same or similar job and being paid equally. But here we're also talking about extending uh, 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 about the work that may be of an entirely different nature. So two people doing different jobs but when we, you actually evaluate these jobs, their value might be very similar. You know, another thing that, um, or compounding factor, I should say, is unpaid care work. Um, and in the ILO care report, the magnitude of unpaid work globally was highlighted. And in many ways, we've already said this, COVID shone a light on the ways in which unpaid labor actually underpines our economy. And you said in an early interview that, um, I love this quote, the heart of change in care work is a change in the power relationship between men and women in unpaid work so women can be present in the workforce. So how is that power relationship between gender and unpaid work different across developed and developing countries? You've hit on this a little bit, but um, and in what way, if any, shifts are you seeing in the division of unpaid labor? This is a very important question because you're touching on um, on one of the key issues mm -hmm. that we need to address when we when we want to uh, to advance the discourse on gender equality, uh, which is the, the heavy amount of unpaid care work that women and men, but women in particular, uh, do on daily basis uh, for no remuneration, and that is work that is necessary, essential. Mm -hmm. For for any progression of the society, because it's it's an extremely important part of uh, of of the normal functioning of societies, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so here we we have quite um, disturbing data in reality, because across the world and there is no exception, uh, women perform three quarters of unpaid care work. Mm -hmm. so, 22% of the total amount of hours dedicated to unpaid care work, which goes from taking care of yourself or taking care of your children, of your family members, etc., is provided by women. And in no country in the world uh, do men and women provide an equal share of unpaid care work. So this is not happening anywhere, not even in those countries that have advanced tremendously on, uh, on trying to redistribute unpaid care work. Um, so women globally uh, every day perform 4.25, 4 hours and 25 minutes of unpaid work compared to 1 hour and 23 minutes for men. And if we were to do some, uh, you know, if we were to play around with these numbers, we would be talking of 2 billion people working 8 hours per day for free with no remuneration. And if we were to give a value to these hours, we would be talking of approximately 
11 trillion US dollars mm -hmm. uh, percent of the global GDP. So we are talking of, you know, an important share of, that goes completely invisible and that is not remunerated and that is distributed in a very unfair way. Mm -hmm. Now, you were asking me about the differences. Um, there are certainly differences in countries, um, but in reality, the differences are very little. Um, we can say, for instance, that women spend more time in unpaid care work than men in every region, ranging from 1.7 times more in the Americas to 4.7 times in the Arab states. So here the question is, uh, what shifts are we seeing in terms of division of uh, unpaid care work? And we can say that um, there is certainly more attention to the issue on a global scale and also at country levels, uh, because there is an understanding of, uh, of, of, of the fact that uh, being productive uh, also means to, to have uh, um, to be able to take care of whoever you need to take care uh, without too much stress and to be able to dedicate more time to, to be productive. Uh, but in the, and in the current organization of societies, um, there's quite a lot of work that needs to be done to redistribute unpaid care work. Um, but reconciling the worlds of work with the world of care is one of the key challenges uh, uh, that we really need to actively, uh, you know, attack and and uh, and and try to to work on it. And to do that, we need reliable gender disaggregated data. That's certainly an important aspect. But what we need the most is well designed uh, care infrastructures, care services, care leave policies. Uh, and combined uh, flexible working arrangements. And I think COVID has advanced a little bit this discourse. Both conversations with Monica and Emanuela are reminders of the inequalities that persist in the world of work, and that International Equal Pay Day is a call to action to address issues of gender equality and continue striving for equal pay for work of equal value. For our part at the Pay Equity Commission of Ontario, we focus on compliance with Ontario's Pay Equity Act, education, and outreach to close the gender wage gap. The Pay Equity Commission is an agency of the Ministry of Labour, Training and Skills Development in Ontario, a ministry that is vital to supporting a vibrant and cared for workforce across the province. As we think about the intention behind International Equal Pay Day and move into economic recovery, I think all of us would agree that a significant contributor to an economy's well-being is employment. Employment that pays well and offers opportunity for personal and professional self-actualization. The pays well part is central to our work. We focus on women and work and inequalities that persist in the labor market based on the devaluation of work historically or typically done by women, or worse, work that is stereotyped as women's work. Our office addresses this by making sure that work of equal value is compensated for equitably within an organization. We hope through a series of conversations published at level.payingfield.ca, you will gain a greater understanding of how discrimination more generally is linked to pay inequity, how common myths about the gender wage gap enable it to persist, how policymakers, leaders, activists, and women globally and here at home are making progress, and how achievements in technology and software may actually help us evolve past constructed inequitable norms and into equality to finally level the paying field.